Fred Astaire. Fred Astaire was born Frederick Austerlitz on May 10, 1899, in Omaha, Nebraska, the son of Joanna Ann and Frederick Fritz Austerlitz. Astaire's mother dreamed of escaping Omaha by her children's talents. Astaire's sister, Adele Astaire, was an instinctive dancer and singer early in her childhood. Joanna planned a brother and sister act, common in vaudeville at the time, for her two children. Although Fred refused dance lessons at first, he easily mimicked his older sister's steps and took up piano, accordion, and clarinet. When their father lost his job, the family moved to New York City in January 1905 to launch the show business careers of the children. They began training at the Alvini Master School of the Theater, an academy of cultural arts. Fred and Adele's mother suggested they change their names to Astaire, as she felt Austerlitz was reminiscent of the Battle of Austerlitz. Family legend attributes the name to an uncle surnamed Lustaire. As a result of their father's salesmanship, Fred and Adele landed a major contract and played the Orpheum circuit in the Midwest, Western, and some southern cities in the U.S. Soon, Adele grew to at least three inches taller than Fred, making for an odd pairing. The family decided to take a two-year break from show business to let time take its course and to avoid trouble from the Gary Society and the child labor laws of the time. The career of the Astaire siblings resumed with mixed fortunes, though with increasing skill and polish as they began to incorporate tap dancing into their routines. Astaire's dancing was inspired by Bill Bojangles Robinson and John Bubbles Sublet. From vaudeville dancer Aurelio Cochilla, they learned the tango, waltz, and other ballroom dances popularized by Vernon and Irene Castle. By age 14, Fred had taken on the musical responsibilities for their act. He first met George Gershwin, who was working as a song plugger for Jerome H. Remix Music Publishing Company in 1916. Fred had already been hunting for new music and dance ideas. Their chance meeting was to affect the careers of both artists profoundly. Astaire was always on the lookout for new steps on the circuit and was starting to demonstrate his ceaseless quest for novelty and perfection. The Astaires broke into Broadway in 1917 with Over the Top, a patriotic review formed for U.S. and Allied troops at this time as well. They followed up with several more shows. Adele's sparkle and humor drew much of the attention, owing in part to Fred's careful preparation and sharp supporting choreography. She still set the tone of their act, but by this time, Astaire's dancing skill was beginning to outshine his sisters. During the 1920s, Fred and Adele appeared on Broadway and in the London stage. They won popular acclaim with the theater crowd on both sides of the Atlantic in shows such as Jerome Kern's The Bunch and Judy, 1922, George and Ira Gershwin's Lady Be Good, 1924, and Funny Face, 1927, and later in The Bandwagon, 1931. Fred's tap dancing was recognized by then as among the best. After the close of Funny Face, the Astaires went to Hollywood for a screen test, now lost, at Paramount Pictures, but Paramount deemed them unsuitable for films. They split in 1932 when Adele married. Fred went on to achieve success on his own on Broadway and in London with Gay Divorcee, later made into the film The Gay Divorcee. While considering offers from Hollywood, the end of the partnership was traumatic for Astaire, but stimulated him to expand his range. Free of the brother-sister constraints from the former pairing and working with new partner Claire Luce, Fred created a romantic partner dance to Cole Porter's Night and Day, which had been written for Gay Divorcee. The success of the stage play was credited to this number, and when recreated in The Gay Divorcee in 1934, the film version of the play, it ushered in a new era in film the dance. According to Hollywood Folklore, a screen test report on a stare for RKO Radio Pictures now lost along with the test, is reported to have read, Can't sing, can't act, balding, can dance a little. The producer of the Astaire Rogers Pictures, Pedro S. Berman, claimed he never heard the story in the 1930s and that it only emerged years afterward. Astaire later clarified, insisting that the report had read, Can't act, slightly balding, also dances. In any case, the test was clearly disappointing, and David Selznick, who had signed Astaire to RKO and commissioned the test, stated, in a memo, I am uncertain about the man, but I feel in spite of his enormous ears and bad chin line that his charm is so tremendous that it comes through even on this wretched test. However, this did not affect RKO's plans for a stare. They lent him for a few days to MGM in 1933 for his significant Hollywood debut in the successful musical film Dancing Lady. In the movie, he appeared as himself, dancing with Joan Crawford. On his return to RKO, he got fifth billing after fourth billed Ginger Rogers in the 1933 Dolores Del Rio vehicle, flying down to Rio. 
In a review, a Variety magazine attributed its massive success to Astaire's presence. Having already been linked to his sister Adele on stage, Astaire was initially very reluctant to become part of another dance team with Ginger Rogers. He wrote to his agent, I don't mind making another picture with her, but as for this team idea, it's out. I've just managed to live down one partnership, and I don't want to be bothered with any more. However, he was persuaded by the apparent public appeal of the Astaire Rogers pairing. The partnership and the choreography of Astaire and Herm's Pan helped make the dancing an important element of the Hollywood film musical. Astaire and Rogers made nine films together at RKO. Six out of the nine Astaire Rogers musical became the biggest money makers for RKO. All of the films brought a certain prestige and artistry that all the studios coveted at that time. Their partnership elevated them both to stardom. Astaire received a percentage of the film's profits, something scarce in actors' contracts at that time. Astaire revolutionized dance on a film by having complete autonomy over its presentation. He is credited with two important innovations in early film musicals. First, he insisted that a closely tracked dolly camera film a dance routine in as few shots as possible, typically with just four to eight cuts, while holding the dancers in full view at all times. This gave the illusion of an almost stationary camera filming with an entire dance in a single shot. Astaire famously quipped, Either the camera will dance, or I will. Astaire maintained this policy from his first film in 1934 until his last film musical, Finian's Rainbow, in 1968, when director Francis Ford Coppola overruled him. Astaire's second innovation involved the context of the dance. He was adamant that all song and dance routines be integral to plot lines of the film. Instead of using dance as a spectacle, Astaire used it to move the plot along. Astaire left RKO in 1939 to freelance and pursue new film opportunities, with mixed though generally successful outcomes. He played alongside Bing Crosby in Holiday Inn, 1942. He made two pictures with Rita Hayworth. Their first film, You'll Never Get Rich, 1941, catapulted Hayworth to stardom. In the movie, Astaire integrated for the third time Latin American dance idioms into his style. His second film with Hayworth, You Were Never Lovelier, 1942, was equally successful. It featured a duet to Kern's I'm Old Fashioned, which became the centerpiece of Jerome Robbins' 1983 New York City Ballet a Tribute to Astaire. Always insecure and believing his career was beginning to falter, Astaire surprised his audience by announcing his retirement during the production of his next film, Blue Skies, 1946, again with Bing Crosby. He nominated Putting on the Ritz as his farewell dance. After announcing his retirement in 1946, Astaire concentrated on his horse racing interests, and in 1947 founded the Fred Astaire Dance Studios, which he subsequently sold in 1966. A share of retirement did not last long as he returned to the big screen to replace an injured Gene Kelly in Easter Parade, 1948, opposite Judy Garland, Ann Miller, and Peter Lawford. He followed up with a final reunion with Rogers, replacing Judy Garland, in The Barclays of Broadway, 1949. Both of these films revived Sarah's popularity, and in 1950, he starred in two musicals, Three Little Words with Vera Ellen and Red Skelton, and Let's Dance with Betty Hutton, who was on loan out to Paramount. While Three Little Words did quite well at the box office, Let's Dance was a financial disappointment. Royal Wedding, 1951, with Jane Powell and Peter Lawford, proved to be very successful, but The Belle of New York, 1952, with Vera Ellen, was a critical and box office disaster. The Bandwagon, 1953, received rave reviews from critics and drew huge crowds, but because of its high cost, it failed to make a profit on its first release. Soon after, Astaire, like the other remaining stars at MGM, was let go from his contract because of the advent of television and the downsizing of film production. In 1954, Astaire was about to start work on a new musical, Daddy Longlegs, with Leslie Caron at 20th Century Fox. Then his wife Phyllis became ill and suddenly died of lung cancer. Astaire was so bereaved that he wanted to shut down the picture and offered to pay the production costs out of his pocket. However, Johnny Mercer, the film's composer and Fox Studio executives, convinced him that work would be the best thing for him. Daddy Longlegs did moderately well at the box office. His next film for Paramount, Funny Face, 1957, teamed him with Audrey Hepburn and Kay Thompson. Despite the fullness of the production and the good reviews from critics, it failed to make his, back its cost. Similarly, Astaire's next project, his final musical to MGM, Silk Stockings, 1957, in which he co-starred with Sid Charisse, also lost money at the box office. Afterward, Astaire announced that he was retiring from dancing and film. His legacy at this point was 30 musical films in 25 years. Astaire did not retire from dancing altogether. He made a series of four highly rated Emmy Award winning musical specials for television in 1958, 1959, 1960, and 1968. Each featured Barry Chase, with whom Astaire enjoyed a renewed period of dance creativity. 
The first of these programs, 1958's An Evening with Fred Astaire, won nine Emmy Awards, including Best Single Performance by an Actor and Most Outstanding Single Program of the Year. It was also noteworthy for being the first major broadcast to be pre-recorded on color videotape. Astaire won the Emmy for Best Single Performance by an Actor. The choice had a controversial backlash because many believe his dancing in the special was not the type of acting for which the award was designed. At one point, Astaire offered to return the award, but the Television Academy refused to consider it. Astaire played Julian Osborne, a non-dancing character, in the nuclear war drama On the Beach, 1959. He was nominated for a Golden Globe Best Supporting Actor Award for his performance, losing to Stephen Boyd in Ben-Hur. Astaire appeared in non-dancing roles in three other films and several television series from 1957 to 1969. Astaire's last major musical film was Finian's Rainbow, 1968, directed by Francis Ford Coppola. The film was a modest success, both at the box office and among critics. Astaire continued to act in the 1970s. He appeared on television as the father of Robert Wagner's character Alexander Mundy in It Takes a Thief. In the movie The Towering Inferno, 1974, he danced with Jennifer Jones and received his only Academy Award nomination in the category of Best Supporting Actor. He voiced the mailman narrator, S.D. Kluger, in the 1970s animated television specials Santa Claus is Coming to Town and The Easter Bunny is Coming to Town. Astaire also appeared in the first two That's Entertainment documentaries in the mid-1970s. In the summer of 1975, he made three albums in London, the last an album of duets with Bing Crosby. In 1976, Astaire played a supporting role as a dog owner in the cult movie The Amazing Dobermans. He played Dr. Seamus Scully in the French film The Purple Taxi, 1977. In 1978, he co-starred with Helen Hayes in a well-received television film A Family Upside Down, in which they played an elderly couple coping with failing health. Astaire won an Emmy Award for his performance. He made a well-publicized guest appearance on the science fiction television series Battlestar Galactica in 1979 as Chameleon. He acted nine different roles in The Man in the Santa Claus Suit in 1979. His final film role was a 1981 adaptation of Peter Straub's novel Ghost Story. This horror film was also the last for two of his most prominent castmates, Melvin Douglas and Douglas Fairbanks Jr., Always immaculately turned out, he and Cary Grant were called the best-dressed actors in American movies. Astaire remained a male fashion icon even into his later years, eschewing his trademark top hat, white tie, and tails, which he hated. Instead, he favored a breezy, casual style of tailored sport jackets, colored shirts, and slacks, the last usually held up by the distinctive use of an old tie or silk scarf in place of a belt. In 1933, despite his family's objections, Astaire married 25-year-old Phyllis Potter, a Boston-born New York socialite. Phyllis's death from lung cancer at the age of 46 ended 21 years of blissful marriage and left Astaire devastated. Astaire attempted to drop out of the film Daddy Long Legs, 1955, which he was in the process of filming, offering to pay the production cost to date, but was persuaded to stay. In addition to Phyllis Potter's son, Peter, from a former marriage, the Astaires had two children. The Astaires' son, Fred Jr., appeared with his father in the movie Midas Run, and later became a charter pilot and rancher. The Astaire's daughter, Ava Astaire, born in 1942, remains involved in promoting her father's legacy. Intensely private, Fred Astaire was rarely seen on the Hollywood social scene. Instead, he devoted his spare time to his family and his hobbies, which included horse racing, playing the drums, songwriting, and golfing. He was good friends with David Niven, Randolph Scott, Clark Gable, and Gregory Peck. David Niven described him as a pixie, timid, always warm-hearted, with a penchant for schoolboy jokes. In 1946, his horse, Triplicate, won the Hollywood Gold Cup and the San Juan Capistrano Handicap. He remained physically active well into his 80s. He took up skateboarding in his late 70s and was awarded a life membership in the National Skateboard Society. At 78, he broke his left wrist while skateboarding in his driveway. He also had an interest in boxing and true crime. On June 24, 1980, at the age of 81, he married a second time. His second wife, Robin Smith was 45 years his junior and a jockey who rode for Alfred Gwynn Vanderbilt Jr. Astaire died of pneumonia on June 22, 1987, at the age of 88. His body was buried at Oakwood Memorial Park Cemetery in Chatsworth, California. One of his last requests was to thank his fans for their years of support. Astaire's life has never been portrayed on film. He always refused permission for such portrayals, saying, 
However much they offer me, and offers come in all the time, I shall not sell. Astaire's will included a clause requesting that no such betrayal ever take place. He commented, It is there because I have no particular desire to have my life misinterpreted, which it would be.